We got a dying coyote out here. I'm trying to concentrate. The light's falling down, but hey, we got this. We are virtual. We're gonna own it, and we're that thing's gonna break, but we got it. We're good. Hey, it's number one best-selling author and keynote speaker, Eric Quammen, but most of you know me as Equal Man. Today, we wanna stay happy, we wanna stay healthy as we work our way through quarantine. We actually have a new book coming out called The Focus Project, so be on the lookout for that. Really help you focus on what matters in today's world. Again, that's The Focus Project. But today, what we wanted to do is get seven super tips from America's doctor. That's right, without further ado, here are seven super tips from Dr. Fauci. I made a decision that I think was one of the best decisions in my life, and that is to go by the principle that when people criticize, even people who look different, act different than you, don't come from the same background as you, start criticizing you in a very uh, iconoclastic way, that there's always some degree and sometimes a big degree of truth in what they're saying. Mm. So rather than run away from the activists, which m most, if not all, of my scientific colleagues did because they were challenging the scientific model. Only scientists can know what's the best thing to do in a disease. Mm. Only scientists would know how to design a clinical trial that they kind of uh, shied away, not shied away, ran away from them. I, I started to just listen to what they were saying and even though they were attacking me personally. And the reason I was being attacked personally, because very early on in the years of the pandemic, I was one that was out there. I was on television, I was in the radio, I was in the newspapers as the federal government. Mm. And at the time when Reagan was president, he, for a number of reasons, did not even mention the word AIDS until his second term. So when the activists justifiably wanted some say in their fate, their fate being, where is the research going? What about access to clinical trials? I became the face of the federal government. So when they started demonstrating, they were demonstrating on campus in front of my office, like, why aren't you releasing more drugs? Not realizing that I'm not the FDA. I don't do that. Uh, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? So what I did is that I brought them into my office the first time ever anybody did. So rather than have them arrested, I sat down and started to listen to what they were saying. And it became clear to me that despite the drama, despite the theater, they were making absolute perfect sense that it was unconscionable for the government when you have no alternative to go by the old rules. There's a clinical trial, you could only have 100 people in it and your hematocrit has to be this level and your BUN has to be this level, otherwise you're not gonna get into the trial, as opposed to saying, why don't we do the clinical trial and let access to other people. So it was a difficult time, but once you got past the, you know, I, I, I used to joke around and say, I took the old motto from the Godfather, it's nothing personal, it's strictly business. And it was strictly business for them. There wasn't anything personal against me. And as it turned out, many of the activists have become and are now some of my closest friends and colleagues. In my own case, almost immediately upon graduation from college and certainly upon graduation from medical school, I learned that my student days had actually just begun. In whatever field or career ch path you choose, if you are to be true to yourselves and live up to your full potential, you would live your life as a perpetual student. The scope of what you have learned here at The Ohio State University, and importantly, what you will need to learn after you leave here is like a giant mosaic. And this mosaic of your knowledge is eternally unfinished, as well it should be. I think a little bit different, but had some overlap with what I think you're referring to right now, which I have to deal with right now, is the lack of vaccine. And people use the word anti-vaxxers. And the one thing I've learned dealing with them that certainly people not vaccinating their children is without a doubt the cause of the outbreaks that we're seeing in Brooklyn with the Hasidic Jews, in Minnesota with the Somalians, in Washington state. And when you're trying to deal with people who are not vaccinating their children, you can't treat them as a unidimensional group because it's not. What you have is those who are really philosophically 
anti-vaccine. Don't you do anything to my child. I'm a libertarian. I'll decide what goes with my child. There are a number of other people who are just misinformed. And the big area of misinformation is that measles and measles, mumps, rubella causes autism, which as we all know, I think everybody in the room knows, was based on a fraudulent study by a person whose medical licensure was taken away from them. Yet, it gets on the internet and people see it and they still believe it. So those people you try to get good scientific basis, good data, and try and appeal to their rational way. There's another group who don't vaccinate their children because they don't have access to health care, or they kind of think, well, maybe if I put it off because you know I, I got plenty of time before they go to school. You can win all those over. With regard to the people who are purely anti-vax, and that's the big argument that's going on right now, what should state, local, or even the federal government do to compel them? Back when the drugs were being tested before we had triple combination, the activist community wanted me to come out because I had really developed a very strong relationship with them and say that people who were ineligible for a clinical trial should have the opportunity to have access to drug outside of the clinical mm -hmm. trial. We call that parallel track. And there was an activist in San Francisco named Marty Delaney who was a very close friend of mine and a couple of ACT UP people in New York, Jim Igo and others, who were really pushing me to do that, and they felt it would only happen if someone of my visibility came out. The FDA and the Department of Health and Human Services was completely against that because they thought it would essentially disrupt the integrity of the clinical trial process. And I went to San Francisco and, and saw the havoc that this was reaping. People were not able to get on drug even though they absolutely needed it, if anything, just for hope because mm -hmm. of the rigid guidelines, and I just got up at a town hall meeting in downtown San Francisco and publicly said that I completely disagree with the government's uh, policy of not allowing parallel track, and I urged us to do that. And fortunately or unfortunately, there was a New York Times reporter in the front row of the town hall meeting, and it made the front page of the New York Times the next day, and the San Francisco Examiner, and the LA Times, and I thought that I was in some serious trouble, but I wasn't, because as soon as I said that, all of a sudden everyone said, wow, that's probably what we should do. And that's what we actually did. But I, that was a time when, as you were alluding to, I was not sure what would happen to me, because it was very public coming out again by a government official against a government policy, which is not a smart thing to do sometimes. Uh, do you have any advice for us on how you talk to non-scientists, uh, politicians, yeah. people? in power without talking down to them? Yeah. Well, I learned a long time ago that if you're a scientist and you're there because of your scientific credibility, the time to be really smart and appear smart is when you're doing the experiment, you're analyzing your data. When you're trying to explain something to somebody, the goal is not to appear to be so smart. Hmm. The goal is to be understood. Hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> the problem is, I know when I, I tell this to fellows in my laboratory when they go and present in front at meetings, that um, I would rather deliver a speech or a lecture or a commentary to 100 people in a room where 98% of them understand what I'm saying rather than have 2% of them think I'm really brilliant. Because if you go and aim at the 2% and say, wow, boy, that's really terrific, and the 98% of them are scratching their heads saying, what did he say? Then you failed. And that's what happens when you go before the Congress, and that's certainly what happens when you have the limited time you have when you go into the White House. Mm. You've got to have, you know, what is the question? What is my message? And you have a very short time to do it and just be crystal clear. You are graduating from a most extraordinary institution. The young men and women of The Ohio State University are the future leaders of our society. And indeed, we need you, for you are the hope of our nation and the world. Leadership is a gradual process that you've already begun when you enrolled here at Ohio State. I speak not necessarily of officially designated leadership, for leadership takes many forms, including the quiet 
and subtle leadership of example. Do not believe for a moment that you are too young to begin to assume leadership roles. There is a quote that is attributed to the famous Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw, whose career spanned the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I never liked the quote as a young man myself, and I like it even less now that I am no longer a young man. The quote is, ah, the pity that youth is wasted on the young, implying that young people have boundless energy, great vigor, and a bright future, but because they're so young, they do not appreciate what this means, nor do they take proper advantage of it. Well, my friends, prove Mr. Shaw wrong. Take advantage of that youth and start doing your thing right now for yourselves and for society. You do not need to wait. You are ready for the world, and the world certainly is ready for and needs you. We are currently confronting an unprecedented global pandemic, and I am profoundly aware that celebrating your graduation virtually is extremely disappointing at best. However, we must adapt to this extraordinary situation, as you have done so well, and unite in overcoming the challenges we face because of COVID-19. We need your talent, your energy, your resolve, and your character to get through this difficult time. In the next phase of your lives, whatever professional path you choose, all of you, directly or indirectly, will be doing your part, together with the rest of us, to come out from under the shadow of this pandemic. Hopkins has a rich tradition of nurturing scholars who excel in their fields of study and by extension enhance the global society in which we live. I have no doubt you will become leaders in your respective fields and help respond to the many public health and other challenges to come. So congratulations on your graduation, keep well, and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you for joining us for today's seven super tips from Dr. Fauci. We hope it helps you make your way through these unprecedented times. And again, be on the lookout for our new book, The Focus Project, as it should help you each and every day. Until next time, this is Equal Man reminding all of us, it's not what we take from the world, it is what we leave behind.